is up, Shark Nation. Welcome to another episode of the Shark Pod. We are back uh, this week with a guest, uh, Danny O'Neill of Animus Labs. Uh, Mark Baker is also here in Glenagiri. How are you doing, Mark? Good, Luke. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Danny, welcome to the uh, Shark Pod. How's it going? Very good, thanks. Good to be with you guys. Yeah, delighted, delighted to have you on here. So, Mark, just give you some background here. Um, I connected with uh, Danny on LinkedIn, uh, saw what he was doing over at Animus Labs. It kind of fits into a few of the things that we've uh, looked in, looked into uh, lately. Kind of business enablement, sales enablement, trying to make the sales process easier, digitize a lot of the stuff that's happening. Um, we've probably had uh, three or four. Uh, people in that kind of area lately. And um, so delighted to have Danny on here. Danny's the, the co-founder uh, and CEO of that, uh, that business. Um, he also told us that he's, uh, <laughs> he was in the uh, NDRC cohort with uh, our friend Connor Sheridan. Shout out, Connor. Hope you're listening out there. Um, so Danny, I was going to say welcome again, but I've already said that. Let's just get straight into this. Uh, give As a background for the people listening, um, Danny's had a, a long career uh, in in Dell would be the kind of the, the biggest part of the, the career. And then he's done some stuff after that around, it seems like it's all around AI and it's all around kind of uh, productivity and stuff like that. So we'll dig in there. Um, so Animus Labs, for those of people who haven't, haven't heard of that yet, uh, what, how would you describe that uh, to the people? Yeah. Um, so Animus, uh, Animus Labs is actually, I founded two years ago and initially it was a consultancy business. Um, I was helping Irish, mostly Irish tech companies with uh, sales performance uh, and how to kind of construct sales and marketing and how to get them working more seamlessly together and so on. And that gradually evolved into a product company called Animus. So Animus Labs, uh, we have a a product technology called Animus and it's a, uh, in in short, it's a, a sales collaboration hub that helps B2B sales teams do a better job at developing opportunities and closing more deals. Perfect. And is it, is the delivery system of that, is that like a, is it on the back of something like a Salesforce or something that it's like a plugin for that or is it completely? Yeah, it's a cloud hosted SaaS based product, uh, very standard uh, as you know, in terms of products in that space. Uh, our view is that we've built it in such a way that it connects into all of that ecosystem. So, whether it's HubSpot on the marketing side or Salesforce or all the way down to, you know, customer success, Zendesk, Gainsight, our vision for the product is that it, it kind of sits at the center of that ecosystem and, and really is the place where different members of the sales team collaborate. It's interesting as well, because as you go up the, I guess, the value chain in sales, it gets way more complex. It gets way more people are, are going to be involved. It's more of a team effort, right? Um, so I noticed that with the uh, normal CRM products, it's not really set up for collaboration in that way. Um, like Salesforce, HubSpot, it's not, it, it is, it, they're all kind of designed to measure the performance of the individual, I think, right? Um, yeah. It's interesting to see the kind of, the, the breadth of, uh, of what we can do there. What's the... It, What's the kind of, what would we say, what's the, the target market for the type of sales teams that we want to be using the product? Yeah, um, so you're exactly right. As you say, you know, um, when you look at B2B selling, it's a, it's a very broad spectrum. On, on, the, on the one end, you've got quite, you know, simple transactional selling, which are fairly repeatable, right? There's, it's not too complex. You know, the customer buying process is fairly straightforward. And then you've got that long spectrum all the way to complex enterprise selling, where we see you know, constant change, lots of decision makers on the customer side, convoluted backwards and forwards decision making. Um, and, and really, as you say, you know, solutions in themselves have become much more technical to sell, generally speaking. And because of that, you, you, you need the team. You need to bring a team together. Um, so what we see, and we, you know, even going back to my Dell days, we would have internal account managers, we would have field salespeople, we'd have our technical experts on storage and networking, we'd have software experts, and on and on and on, right? Um, so today, and I'm not even gonna say it's just complex selling, but generally speaking, you know, to, to be successful in B2B selling today, generally speaking, a team effort is needed. Uh, and that's really a question of bringing in experts 
at the right time across the sales process. So I think Animus Labs fundamentally is helping to bring those different team members together really so they can, you know, engage with the customer in a, in a, in a kind of meaningful way, right. And deliver value at each point of their buying process. Perfect. It's really, really interesting for me as well, because I've got like, if, let's take HubSpot. I know we talk about HubSpot a lot on the, on the podcast, Mark, but uh, it's just because I, I spent all my time <laughs> working there. Like, but, um, every, every year or every two years, we're adding another hub to the suite of products. Um, so what, when I started, uh, whatever, four years ago, we were, we were doing CRM, but we were really a marketing uh, platform, right? So it's very, I know how to sell that. I know how to, uh, I'm really selling to a marketing team. Maybe there's this uh, CFOs involved in the buying process, you know, but it's, it's pretty straightforward. Now uh, we're selling a marketing product, a sales product, and a service product, um, and a CMS. So there, that's a vast amount of people that we're trying to get the go-ahead on this. And it, it really does um, create a lot of, um, a, a lot of uh, decisions that have to be made about who's going to be uh, doing what in the, in, the, in the buying process, or the selling process. So I've got my, yeah, uh, my sure. sales engineer, I've got my BDRs, I've got everything kind of try to work together. So I do see the, the gap for this. Is there, what's the, uh, like how we're, what's the vision for, for selling this? Is this going to be kind of the MailChimp way where you can just go on and, um, you know, add to cart? Or do you think that this is going to be, is this more of a complex thing to sell? Uh, what, what's the kind of vision for the, the sales process for, for you guys personally? Yeah, that's a, that's, a, that's a great question. And I guess we're at that early phase where you know, we're still trying to f- get that product market fit right. What's, what's been really interesting over the last, uh, I guess, six months, particularly going to the NDRC program, we spent a lot of time talking to various size customers right away from kind of mature enterprise uh, all the way to startups and, and scaling companies. And what's interesting is I think initially we thought, look, you know, we're, we need to lead with this complexity message and we help with complex selling and collaboration and, you know, how, how to get teams to be more responsive and adaptive. And, and that absolutely resonated in the enterprise space for sure. But what we found, and I think many founders have found this, right, selling into enterprise from the get-go is, is difficult, you know. They themselves, strangely enough, have complex decision-making processes. So we were kind of trapped in this irony, I guess. Um, but interestingly then, um, the startup founders, people in growing kind of tech companies, suddenly were, you know, start, start we, f- we found this kind of natural pull where they were absolutely could identify with the, the, the difficulty of selling into, into their customers. And we're really keen to try and figure out how can we build this culture, build this best practice in from the get-go. Hey. So when we described Animus as, you know, not only trying to help you get the collaboration culture right, but also actually trying to guide you with some sales best practice, they really found that, uh, found that interesting. Um, and when we said, look, we're not, we're, not, we're not trying to compete with lots of other products out there that do a great job in their space. We're trying to pull all those signals together so your teams can make sense of it and respond more effectively. They really got that. So, um, I yeah, like, I like that idea of the, the kind of the smaller companies that are on the way up because they're trying to put in uh, structures that they can like scale. If they're going to be a scale company, I'd say that that's a lot of the decision making as well. Can this work at 10 X what we're doing now? Do you know? Yeah, for sure. And, and initially, you know, of course, some of these smaller teams might only have two or three founders. So, you know, the, the collaboration piece between two people, I mean, it wasn't that complex, but as soon as they, could see the value in, you know, as they grew and they brought in marketing people or more technical people or customer success further down the line, they could really see the value of starting to pull that team together and wrapping them around the customer. And so they absolutely bought into that. That's cool. And so maybe, because this has come up a couple of times uh, on the the Shark Pod and we've never really uh, dove into it. The NDRC, the, the kind of accelerator programs that are out there, you, you mentioned that you've actually, this business has been going for about two years. At what stage did you think, okay, this might be interesting to try to, to get involved with this type of uh, assistance or did they kind of, do they kind of reach out to good fit companies? How does that process work? 
Yeah, uh, I, I reached out to them. So I was, I was uh, working uh, with a company called SureSkills, who were uh, a Dublin-based learning services company. And uh, I left them really with this, uh, I guess, burning desire to, to try and solve some problems that I seen in the, in the kind of sales B2B selling space. Um, <clears throat> and I really didn't know what it was going to look like. I had some, some concepts, some ideas that I, I really wanted to test out. Uh, so I reached out to Alan Costello uh, in the NDRC and I literally had a coffee with him. This is going back a year and a half ago. And I gave him some high level kind of, here's what, here's the problems that I see. Here are the challenges. Here are the tools that are out there. They're not quite hitting the mark. I think there's something interesting to do in here. And he gave me a great, great piece of advice. He said, um, whatever you do, don't, don't go build that, right? You know, <laughs> don't go throw money into that. Uh, he said, go and, go and find a way of doing uh, what he called a dumb MVP. Go and find one of your customers that you're doing some consultancy with and, and see is there a way to test out those concepts without actually building anything, right? Do it really simply. Is it is a process? Is it training? Is it you know, templates, Excel? Go, go try it out and, and out, learn through that experience. And if, if the customer starts to see value, then, then maybe there is something here. So it was literally a reach out, a connection, a coffee, some good advice. And I literally went back to him every few months and gave him an update. Lovely. Because the, that's, the testing out the minimum viable product is always, a, is always a good thing to do. We, 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 sometimes we do like a, me and Mark will just do a, a breakdown of a book or whatever that we, that we like yeah. or that, that we're currently reading. Um, and one of the books was the four hour work week where they talk about the, the testing is one of the most important things. And I think sometimes entrepreneurs can get obsessed with the, uh, with their idea and they say mm. it, people don't know that they want it yet. Right. Um, and, and they'll put it there, you know, five years or, and all their life savings into something where the market wasn't there. So I think that's a really good shark tip for all those uh, entrepreneurs out there that are, uh, that are listening or entrepreneurs as a lot of the guys are, uh, including myself, Mark, what do you think? Yeah, I think it's, it's that typical problem of you have to be obsessed with your product or with your idea enough to make it work but also then to pull you to pull back at the same time is it's kind of the opposite. So that's where the advice piece comes in. And yeah. obviously that was, was so important to you. I'm always interested in the accelerator um, uh, schemes or whatever you'd call them. Mm. A lot of people aren't aware of them. And to be honest, I don't think myself and Luke were too aware or too knowledge, knowledgeable on it. Um, I'd like to hear more about how it all works and, yeah. You know, where, where should people go? Is, is the NDRC the, the main one to go to? Is there others? What way does the process work? People are probably scared off a little bit uh, at the start. You know, they don't know what it is. If you yeah, I mean, with the NDRC, it's probably the most well-known one in the country. And there are other programs. And the, and the NDRC themselves run two other hubs, one in Waterford IT and one out of Galway as well called Arc Labs, if, if, if I'm right. So the process is... Um, it's, it's really, you know, uh, apply and, and you go and you do your pitch. You have a 10 minute pitch in front of a board, which is terrifying. Uh, you know, they have, uh, <laughs> of course, you know, yeah, you see this as the make or break opportunity, right? So you're in there absolutely giving it your all, trying to get across this, this vision you have. And also, you know, trying to sound like you've, you, you know, your business plan has been well thought through and it makes sense. But of course, you know, all of this is finger in the air at, at such an early stage. So you're trying to sound credible, but that you also have an end goal and, and this is financially viable. But essentially, it's just that interview process. Um, I think they had 140 plus applicants for the beginning of this year's cohort uh, and they whittled that down to seven. So seven of us went through the program. So actually getting accepted onto the program is a, is a pretty big deal in itself. So we were, we were absolutely delighted by that. And then it's really a, a 15, 16 week program of, you know, initially doing a lot more customer discovery, validation, you know, really fine tuning your idea, the pain you're trying to solve, you know, reflecting on the market and where's your fit, all of that kind of, you know, good foundational work that, that you just need to do. And then gradually moving that into uh, building out a business plan, uh, getting your numbers right. Uh, and then the final piece is, is the investor showcase, which is the end of the program where you have a five minute pitch to 
investors from Dublin across the country and, and various people from industry. And that is also terrifying, uh, very terrifying, in fact. Um, but NDRC, I mean, it's, it's a phenomenal program. They, they really challenge you. It's tough going, very intense this year, obviously being remote with, with COVID. Um, they really kind of pull your business left, right and center, challenge you on ideas and concepts and, and the whole thing. Uh, but they get you to a point where you, 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 know, you come out a lot more polished than when you went in and you certainly ruled in, ruled out what kind of business you potentially will be. And the idea is to prepare you so you can go and get follow-up investments, seed, series A, whatever the case may be. And who are the, who are the people involved and what skill sets are they bringing to the table for you? In, in terms of NDRC members themselves? Yeah. Oh, they have a broad range of skills and backgrounds. Uh, uh, you know, um, some come from product design, some come from pharma industry. Uh, oh, God, you know, a, a broad, broad spectrum. But actually, what, what I found really, really valuable in the program was the mentors they bring from the industry. Um, we had maybe six, seven different mentors, well, well known in the Irish industry for different aspects of the business. And they literally... You know, whether it's marketing or sales or pulling together your commercials, uh, your business plan, uh, even down to branding and, and so on. They give you, you know, some phenomenal support around thinking about that and getting that right. Uh, so the mentorship in particular was fantastic. And of course, all the members, members of the NDRC team, you know, I don't how many. I think they have four cohorts a year in three different locations. So you can imagine the amount of of businesses going through their fingers so they're just experts in what they do really excellent i'd love to like mm -hmm. i like you're saying there it's it must be a great say if you're if you're really into business you're really into uh, startups and stuff like that if you're on that uh, like the board of the something like the ndrc you're seeing just the future of of stuff that's coming out of ireland you know what I mean? so i was thinking what's what's kind of in it for the for the the mentors you know are they are they getting paid to do this or are they just getting involved with you know talent that they wouldn't see otherwise What's in it for them? Uh, I, I I think there's a small fee, but I wouldn't say there's I wouldn't say that's the driver. They're not in it for the money. <laughs> they're not in it for the money. That's for sure. I think the you know they're experienced, seasoned professionals who've been in the industry for a long time, and I guess they're at a point where they want to give back a little, right? And they want to share their their kind of worldly knowledge and wisdom uh, with the next generation of uh, of founders who are coming coming up through the ranks. So. You know, um, yeah, they're just just really really good people. Give you great insights, great great advice. What I what I was uh, particularly impressed with was how quickly they have such a broad set of experiences and and such obviously you know lots of years in business that they very very quickly could get to the hub of what your business was and what you were trying to do, and could very quickly add value. Literally within 20, 20 minutes, I was amazed. Mm -hmm. But it, uh, I guess it just shows the, the kind of caliber of the people. So you're skipping a huge queue there, you know, in the, the journey of your business. It's, it's, it's a jump start. Yeah. And, hmm. and, and then you get an exposure to the investors at the end of it, which I would assume is one of the biggest parts of it. You just wouldn't I have that, those, yeah. that network without it. Well, it's just, it's just professionalizing you. You know, it's getting you prepared. I mean, I don't think anyone... Uh, really expects that you know at the end of the program there's going to be somebody there with a massive checkbook, but mm -hmm. it's 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 taking you to that next level, giving you that exposure, as you say, you know. Yeah, like like other Mark, like otherwise, how would you get a, a group of investors together to to listen to you for this in that kind of format? Mm -hmm. That yeah. the standardization is uh, a big plus there. Also, like uh, Mark, you mentioned like what's in it for for people that are helping out. Like I remember we had a guy in our podcast called uh, Brian Caulfield. I don't know if you've heard of him uh, before. I know Brian. <laughs> but you know Brian, yeah. yeah. And he was saying that sometimes when you're talking to these new, uh, newer companies, um, like it just gives you, it, the people who want to help out, they're getting almost first crack at this as well. Like if it's something that they, they want to invest in or something that they can get involved in, sometimes yeah. stuff comes from that. So it's like any type of networking, I think, as well. If they're interested in that type of business, it might be kind of a, another way in. So. Interesting as well. Um, okay, so when you, okay, so at this stage you uh, had kind of validated your your process uh, on a kind of a, a dummy uh, basis with some of the consulting work that you've been doing. Yeah. When you validate it, they say, okay, this is this is what we want to do. The the building phase, like, do you have enough kind of tech background to get a 
a bit of a, a like a, a product kind of uh, sketched out, or do you need uh, somebody to come in and, and give you a hand? And that's it. Uh, I needed someone to come and. And give me a hand. I, I don't have a technical background, uh, but in the last company I was working for, we, we were doing a, a corporate spin out. So I got, and we'd, we'd hired a team and we were developing some products. So I'd, I'd had some exposure to it there. Um, but in short, no. And if, if I even tried to say I was in any way technical, you know, people listening to this would, who know me would just kind of crack up. So uh, no, I, I'm not uh, a tech guy. But a friend of mine had had his own startup in the UK a couple of years ago, and he'd been using a, a developer who I really liked his work. And I just kept in touch with that guy, reached out, connected with him, based in the UK. And he came over to Dublin. We spent a couple of days just talking and kind of fleshing out ideas and, and so on. And uh, I've been working with that person for the last uh, year and a half on the product. Perfect. We'll, we will ultimately plan to bring it in house, but it's all about timing. And you know what we've been able to accomplish with uh, with Dan has been uh, has been pretty incredible. It's, it's interesting as well because it's it's something that we should all be kind of thinking of as well. If you're not from a technical background, like I'm not like like anyone who works in tech sales, you'll have a, a certain amount of uh, lingo that you can kind of wade through, or I can understand a lot of the time what. Uh, the, about the the concepts about um, some of the technology that people are using, but building is a, a completely different ball game, right? So, I I do think it's funny. It's something that just popped into my head now when you were talking about that is um, the kind of silo effects that happen within organizations, as in with even in HubSpot, which I think is quite good at bringing a lot of the people together. Maybe not right now because everyone's at home, but at before that when we were all in the office, like I can't really name any product guys. Uh, and HubSpot after working there for four years. And these are the types of things that we should be, if you're, if you're not technical and you think you want to build something in the future, um, you may, not, may want to kind of focus on that for a little bit of uh, networking as well. Um, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, th- I think, you know, and, and this, you know, kind of goes back to some of the philosophy of what we're trying to do with, with the Animus platform. And I've seen this firsthand. Um, you know, when you have a customer uh, and you're engaged with them about, you know, how your product can deliver value. Uh, when you bring a technical perspective into that conversation, um, it just changes the dynamic completely. And some people would say in a bad way, right? I, I don't believe so. They always, they always see a different angle, a different opportunity. They know uh, how technology can add value that you just can never get your head around. So um, I think the more we talk to our tech colleagues, partners, friends, um, the better it'll be for sure. Yeah, absolutely. So even if we could, there's nothing that has ever, in any of the tech companies I worked in, there's never been any real effort to do, maybe that they, do, they don't want the salespeople talking to the, the product people in, in case there's too many spinoffs, but uh, there's never been that, that type of overlap. We even are, like, we have kind of different parties, uh, you know, during the year and stuff. It's not everyone together a lot of the time. Yeah. Uh, so something to think about. Uh, because me and my, uh, one of my friends, um, he was also in sales, not in HubSpot, but in a, a similar company to HubSpot, let's say. Um, and we were talking about a business idea that he wants to, to run. And I noticed that the partner that he had or who he was working with on was, I'm uh, almost identical in skill set to, to him. And I said, maybe there, someone else uh, could have a look in this. It might kind of accelerate this a little bit more if you had a, a different set of eyes, more technical eyes. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's something that we're, we're missing out on uh, as salespeople. Um, but the another kind of interesting part of the journey for you, you were at Dell for a long time, um, training teams there and stuff like that. Do you think that that experience is feeding into the Animus Labs? Like, are you seeing yeah, the problem sure. there that you're solving now? Is You know what I mean? Yeah, for sure. 100%, 100%. And I guess this kind of journey for me probably started about 12, 13 years ago at Dell. Um, I was at Dell for 14 years. Uh, half of that time, I was in sales. Um, started as an account manager, moved up through the ranks of management, um, spent some time out in India helping them set up their business there, supporting the UK market. So that was an incredible experience. Um, and I guess fundamentally, you know, enjoyed managing, et cetera. But I could see that, you know, we're just not spending enough time looking at how to drive performance. And we don't, as a, as a company, didn't at the time anyway, have an idea about what standardization or what best practice really look like. 
Uh, and I guess that uh, that's where my interest was sparked. So I had an opportunity to move out of sales into the kind of ops training role. And, and really, I, I started uh, a project in EMEA initially looking at how do we, how do we think different, differently about how we get our salespeople to work together uh, and how we could engage with customers differently mm-hmm. and develop opportunity and close more sales and all that good stuff. And that's really where this journey started. We put a, a huge focus on uh, really, really thinking about how do we get that team that I mentioned earlier, you know, internal sales, external tech, how do we get them working together in a more coordinated way? Uh, because at the time, we, we literally, it was, Dell was transforming from kind of product to solutions, and they were really trying to figure that out. So often the customer was the one who suffered, right, would have three different calls a week from three different people at Dell, and it was a little bit confusing. So, so part of what I was interested in was how do we orchestrate or how do we coordinate those resources to be a little bit more clever about how they engage with customers. So that was part of it. Um, but the other side that I, I could see clearly was we, we needed to reinvest in, in skills and, and transforming the skill sets that, are, that our salespeople had. Um, Dell salespeople, me included, you know, we phenomenal training. I think Dell were well ahead of their time, you know, back 15, 20 years ago, put a lot of investment in skills and training development, which was great, but it was very focused on transactional type you know, box out, product selling. Yeah. Now they were moving to solutions. So we had to rethink about how we bring all that together, put the right skills into the business and so on. Um, and what I, I guess the learning out of that and uh, for me was, you know, to drive high performance, it's not, just, it's not just people, it's not just product, it's not just process. It's really how do you bring those things together in a, in a, in a way that kind of enables the team uh, to in many ways kind of self-organize and self-direct, right? Because, you know, I guess if you, if you look at how traditional management structures are, it's a lot of top-down command still, right? There's a lot of kind of, you know, sales planning and sales forecasting and account reviews and, you know, what's your number this week? How are we tracking? How are we phasing? What's your recovery plan, right? That's the, the common language of, uh, of a sales uh, manager. But I guess what I found really interesting was that, You know, when you enabled people, when you gave them the opportunity, you gave them a certain level of, you know, autonomy, they had this incredible capability to put their heads together, crack on and and do some really innovative stuff that generated more sales. And the upside of that, right, the upside of that is you get you get these very happy employees who feel liberated, right? You get these happy employees who are going, my God, I'm, I'm being trusted here to go make this happen. Yeah. Uh, so I, I guess it was that, those learnings that, you know, again, kind of developed and evolved over 10 years to, 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 to the Animus platform. And I guess we're trying to bring all that together with, with the platform. And Danny, could you, could you give us like a working example of how, the, how Animus would work in a, in a large company like, like Adele or so on? Yeah, for sure. So, uh, you know, there's, there's really three key parts to it, I guess, right? The first part is the collaboration piece. So, if you can imagine um, bringing a team of four or five cross-functional team members together, so let's say internal sales, maybe external sales, marketing, and, and we know that's becoming more and more important as time goes by because companies are trying to get to this account-based marketing, this personalized experience, this tailoring piece. So that's an important piece. Product, technology, as we've talked about, customer success, right? This, it's this ability to bring that core team together to form a sales collaboration team or pod around an account that you want to develop. So it's the collaboration culture is central to this. What we, we've also built into Animus is a framework of sales best practice that's much more focused on the customer buying experience rather than the inter, an internal sales process. Uh, because we know that, you know, fundamentally customers buy a lot different than they did five, six, seven years ago. You can read challenger seller and you can read challenger customer and the CEB and all that research. We know that fundamentally, you know, customers are now controlling or leading the buying process. So the, the, the framework of sales practice has to be aligned to that rather than our internal sales stages that we like to talk about, right? The sales managers and that framework really um, within Animus what we believe is the real innovation here is that we 
we assign, we're able to assign the best practice tasks and activities to each member of that team that you've constructed. So whether that's your messaging person for marketing or your account manager or your technical person, depending on what phase they are in the customer buying process, we can recommend to them or assign to them specific tasks. So it's a framework of best practice. Now, it's not rigid, and that's absolutely key to call out. We're not saying you must follow this every single step or you're a naughty boy and you're going to get in trouble. What we actually do is this is a framework of reference, a framework of guidance, and you can adapt, you can you know, uh, change, you can add to with the, with the idea really that we're giving you some swim lanes to keep you between as a team so that you can drive a good result but we're allowing you to adjust and adapt it at a, at a customer level. And then the final part is just that is, is the closed loop piece. We, we want to be able to give not just managers, but also the team themselves insights into how effective some of the work they're doing is on the customer. So we capture customer response, uh, promoter scores based on sales messaging that we're creating as a team and delivering as a team. Uh, I'd love to say, you know, it's, high tech and it's, and it's, it's, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's all AI driven and it's, there's intelligence there. It's not, we're trying to drive good old fashioned, you know, B2B sales behavior here. So we're asking the team to really capture that within the system. So they get a really clear picture on what's working, what's not working, things they need to change, things they need to prioritize. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, it does. Yeah. And does somebody need to, to lead that or is everybody, does everybody have their own piece? of the pie and everybody's equal in that process or? Yeah. And um, typically we, it's, and this may change, you know, company to company, but typically it's the account executive, account leads, you know, multiple names, usually sales executive, but usually it's the senior salesperson that kind of plays the quarterback. Mm. So if you, you, uh, if you think of you've identified a target customer, you assign that customer to the account leads, the account lead then within Animus has the ability to reach out and pull in other members of the team. Um, uh, actually that could also be a partner if you're working with a third party partner you, you might want to pull them in to collaborate on the sale but, uh, but yeah the account lead is basically responsible for, for driving the team and coordinating the team across, across that sales process and you mentioned um, best practices what, what would be some of the kind of best practices for B2B business to business sales yeah that's a, that's a great question um, you know, I think, I think, and this again, you know, is based on talking to and working with lots of B2B companies from startups to large enterprise. And there's a common theme across the board. And that theme is, you know, customer decision making has become a lot more complex. And we see a lot more decision makers involved. We, uh, we see from, you know, in, in some companies, seven, eight, nine decision makers, all the way up to in a life sciences company, I was talking to 25 to 30 stakeholders in a room, you right, where you're presenting, and it's, it's just crazy. So, you know, that the, this customer decision-making process has become a lot more challenging, for sure. Uh, customers themselves, interestingly enough, are also um, struggling because they are constantly bombarded with content, right? Uh, you know, every day in their feed, the next solution, the next product, reach out to us, we can help. We do things differently, right? It's a, it's a, it, it's, they're extremely burdened, let's say, with, with, with that content. Um, so I would say, you know, what's really important is that the team needs to come together and figure out a way to head away, not only identify who those decision makers are, but actually start to build a deeper understanding of their buyer personas, What's important to them, you know, buying criteria, motivations, uh, biases, perhaps that are in, lurking in the background and um, understand, gain an understanding of that profile. But the team has to figure out a way. How do you bring them together to form a consensus for, for your solution? Um, when you look at the data, what we see is, you know, on average, 50% plus of deals today just stagnate simply because those decision makers, those stakeholders, just never come to a conclusion, never come to a consensus, right? The deal just stagnates. So it's really, really clear today's B2B sales team has to, has to come together to figure out a way to help the customer through that journey. And they have to be very conscious 
of the different stakeholders who are involved in that decision making and how do you bring them together now that is not easy right i mean that as i described it that is that sounds complicated and, and it is it's it's complex not surprisingly it's a difficult thing to do but the reality is that teams who don't make an attempt to move in that direction are going to still struggle with the same problems you know down the line half their deal stagnating we see close rates in the industry going from 15% upwards, 15, 20, 25% tops. So 75% of deals just either are lost or just never happen. And, and you know, Animus is really about, about helping teams to, to do a better job at closing more of those deals. I love businesses like this, Mark, where you can, when you're selling into a business, if you can, Okay, maybe you can't at the beginning like kind of guarantee uh, increase in sales, but if you can kind of convince them that this this has a possibility to increase sales, anything attached to uh, the the revenue is so much easier to sell than some of the more abstract stuff. Like, just from my own experience, if I sell so selling a marketing product, it it can be we can say okay, how many leads do you need. And the next six months to hit your financial goal, we can come back with a presentation with the software to say, okay, if you put in this, we can not guarantee it, but we can see a path where this can uh, <laughs> where this can happen. Yeah. Um, so it's a, a very strong uh, kind of kind of selling motion towards that type of uh, motivation, like you said. On the other hand, if we sell um, like a, to a service a services team, like the support team, their their motivation is completely different. They actually don't really want to change because any type of change, there's no upside for them other than some efficiencies that they're not really going to get paid on if it is more efficient. There's no, you know, yeah. uh, so it, it's a completely different motivation there. So if you're an account executive, um, like Danny was saying, who is more focused on the person who is easier to sell to, which let's get, be honest, that's what salespeople like myself do as well. We focus on the people who want to talk to us and, who we can really get into um, and without having the knowledge of the motivations of all the other uh, buyers personas, there's just a big gap there that, that needs to be fixed for sure. So it's super, super interesting there. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm interested in that, you know, 75% of, of sales that are kind of in limbo. Those ones that just sit there, they really get me, you know, it's, and, but they're the hardest ones to, to convert that. that it's, it's like the 80, 20 rule again, you know, those, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And, you know, it's um, to, to, to your point about, you know, salespeople just focusing on, you know, the easy sell, right? You know, the, the guy, you know, I'll build a really great relationship with this one person and we'll look after each other and we'll tick the box and we'll have some steady revenue, you know. And, you know, I think those, those days are over, right? I, I, I think I'm, I'm seeing a turning point where business leaders now recognize we, we need to think differently about how we do sales. We just cannot put all this time and investment into having 70% plus of our deals just sit there. Yeah. Um, so I, I've really seen, and certainly accelerated with COVID for obvious reasons, um, you know, this, this willingness of sales leaders to say, look, let's, let's look to see how we genuinely can get this transformation right. Uh, and the benefits are multiple, not just for customers in terms of the customer purchase experience, because you know, we're coordinated, the team is coordinated and it's orchestrated and it's delivering value and it's tailored and all that good stuff. And um, for, for the employees, for the sales teams themselves, and um, if you think about it, the five or six members of the team, we're giving transparency to what each member of that team is, is delivering, the role they're taking. And you know, we, we see, we I hear this firsthand, you know, when you talk to business leaders who are need to pull in tech and marketing and so on and so forth, they never get recognition for the work they've done in closing that deal, right? Yeah. You know, it's 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 always the the glory. The the account manager gets the glory, and it's like, oh yeah, and thanks to the team, right? You know, and I'm not even talking about remuneration and reward here. I'm I'm talking even about a, you yeah. know, a, a, the company kind of recognizing the importance of their contribution. So in Animus, we 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 give visibility not only to obviously what the salesperson is doing, but what the other members of the team are bringing to the, to the table. You know? and, and Danny, do you think it's easier to sell uh, B2C, so business to customer than B2B? You know, or is that a, even a question you can ask? I, I've no clue. I've never sold B2C. So oh, okay. <laughs> I'll pass on that one. Oh, have I sold B2C? I did once actually in Australia, I was in Australia backpacking, which in the nineties, which was a, 
a rite of passage at the time uh, that everyone my age uh, had to do. And uh, yeah, I sold some mobile phones. I guess that was B to C for a while. Uh, nice. It's so really... different though. It's so different. It's, I think, I don't yeah, I, I prefer it because I've done, uh, I've done both as well. So, um, like from, from a teenager doing door to door, uh, security systems, um, or, uh, yeah. big enterprise sales, uh, or sorry, certain software deals. Um, I, it, it's a different, a different thing. Like it depends on the type of person that you are as well. Um, we talked about earlier about that transition or, uh, transactional sale. That's very mm. quick. Uh, some of the people that I know like to turn over, they need the wins all the time. Every week they need the wins. Um, and then there's some people that don't mind working in the sales org, like you said, a year to 18 months of, uh, of kind of grinding away for a big deal. I think uh, for me, I'm kind of in the middle. I, 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 I kind of need wins now and then to keep, the, keep the, the fire kind of stoked. Do you know what I mean? If it's a really long-term uh, thing it, it does make it more difficult for me like I, I was one of my friends uh, works in air was an airplane leasing uh, probably not a great industry right now to be in but um, a very lucrative industry you know over, has yeah. been for the last 10 years or whatever um, and like once a year if they're lucky they'll get a big order and I'm just said what that's a that's a lot of pressure all year you know and that's, what, that's a lot of the remuneration is tied to that and I'm like yeah. I don't know if I could just I don't know. I don't know, Mark. Mark Baker, do you think that would be a good way to live? What do you think? Uh, well, I, think I think I always say like a mix of everything. Um, yeah. And I keep everything balanced is, is good. But um, sales, well, I think, we, we, uh, Danny, we always talk about sales. And I'm an, I'm an accountant mm. who, who's in recruitment now. So I, I kind of have a bit of a mix. Um, I felt when I was younger, certainly, that there wasn't as much. Um, sales wasn't kind of in your face that much it was always you know be a profession you know do a profession whatever that may be um is there any good courses you know diplomas anything like that on the sales on the sales side now at the moment that you'd recommend to anyone who's interested in going down that route uh you know well look there's there's probably too many of them out there right to start with i mean you can go to the big guns like CEB and Gartner and they do programs all focused on, I think Gartner have bought CEB who were the, the, the sales kind of think tank that did uh, challenger selling and so on. So, you know, you can go right in at that high level, um, you know, all the way down to your local training company who will be doing a, a, a program. Yeah, pro- most programs have shifted to, to customer focus, right? We, we, you hear time and again, you know, oh, customer centric selling, customer centric team selling, it's all about the customer journey and so on and so forth. And I, I think anyone you identify who's, who's thinking in that way and have redesigned their training programs to focus more on the customer, you're on the right path there, I, w- I would suggest. You know, um, I'm, I'm mostly, I'm not, a, I'm not a big fan of kind of the traditional old programs of spin selling and, you know, time, those t- that time is gone, I think, very much. So, I, I mean, there's, there's, there's tons of them out there. There's, a, you know, I, I, won't, I won't name any specific names, but I would say generally look for a program that is focused on not just the collaboration aspects, the customer aspects, but actually how to construct the skills and capabilities you need in your organization to be very, very responsive and very, very adaptive to customer needs. And if you, and we do some programs like that ourselves, just to, just to plug that uh, part of the consultancy we were, we were doing initially through Animus Labs was, was actually helping sales teams build that culture, build that capability from the ground up. And that usually involves a combination of people, process, technology, people side, actually defining what good sales collaboration looks like within the organization is the first step, you know, breaking down those silos to get sales, marketing and product working together is a critical first step because they're they're just not used to working in that way. Um, So that is step one. The, the, The process piece for me then is, is really goes back to that framework piece. How can you give them, how can you actually show them what great looks like? I'm always amazed that, you know, hey, you know, great selling looks like you need to do these five things. 
And then we just leave it there. Conversation stops, right? Now go do, do those five things, right? And, and, you know, that's what great looks like. Um, I'm a firm believer in that you need to give a framework of what best practice is. Um, so if you're looking for a program that sets out clearly a customer-centric approach to selling, that's, that's really, really key. And then the technology piece for me, which is we hope where Animus is playing, but, um, you know, there are lots of, there are other products out there that help drive collaboration um, in, in the business that help drive kind of program management. Um, some customers we've talked to, are using a combination of tools, you know, whether it's HubSpot or Pipedrive or Salesforce with Trilo or Asana on there, they're trying to bring them together to get this kind of more insightful view of what's going on and, and how to orchestrate the team better. Um, so getting the technology pieces right. If you can bring those three pieces together or you find a program that can help you bring those three pieces together, you're, you're, you're in good shape. I like it. So, hey. Hey, Mark, we've got a, we're at 45. Why don't we jump into the lightning round? I don't know if Danny's ever uh, come across this before, but we've got a kind of a tradition here on the shark pod where Mark brings up his, uh, his quick fire and our quick fire questions. They don't have to be quick fire answers, but we've really, we've got a, a really good insight into all of our guests. And, uh, by doing this, we get to compare very standardized, uh, questions across uh, different industries and stuff. It's super interesting for the listeners. Um, again, no pressure. You can also answer as long or as short as you want. But Mark, what do you, what do you got from? Okay. What apps on your phone do you use the most? Um, a new one I've started to use, All Trails, uh, which uh, is amazing. Uh, it gives you, uh, it literally, obviously, GPS locator knows where you are and can it recommend walking trails all oh. in your area or oh, wow. in the country. And then gives you lots of great detail about those trails, you know. Distance, duration, how difficult, places to stop, all that stuff. It's really good. Cool. That's a great one, actually. I'll download that. Um, what's the best business idea you've never acted upon? Mm, um, you know, I, yeah, I, I don't know. If, for me personally, I don't know if it's about, I always, th- I, have, I always think if I haven't acted on something in the past, it's probably for some good reason that I not couldn't quite articulate at the time, but somewhere down the line, I'll go, thank God I never did that. <laughs> uh, it's just the way it's just my own kind of theory on how things work, I guess. Um, you know, I definitely think there's, there's lots more opportunity in the, in the learning and development space, particularly in, in sales and, and how we get teams to work together. Like if you think about it, there and this goes back to you know my experience in sales training and learning and development if you think about it lots of great solutions out there today that are phenomenal at delivering learning content to you whether it's you know MOOCs or edX or degreed or you know uh, edcast there's dozens and dozens of of great places you can go get learning but actually um i think where it falls down is the transfer of that learning into the workspace into the workflow So you get people who take trainings and you can have it in any size or shape you want nowadays from two minutes to half an hour or, you you know, you name it, the the diversity uh, is huge, but actually, you know, do we, do we, is there any way that the investment in those programs have translated into behavior change? Yeah. And I think we really struggle with that. I think a lot of business leaders, unfortunately still see training and development as a cost you know, as a tick in the box that we have to do and we know we have to do it and we'll make the investment. But actually, I don't know if they really believe it's a true driver of the business. And I think, yeah, I think there's a, a middle piece. There's a space in there somewhere for some piece of technology to do a better job at demonstrating that transfer of learning. I think so. Uh, that I makes think, sense, yeah. That's a great point. I've done lots of, uh, we have the online uh, courses like that you have to do and work for you know compliance and that type of stuff for all those types of stuff that I, I think any business has to do in Ireland you know with their yeah. staff and to, to drive the, the behavior change there's there's no follow-up on that there's a there's a little bit of questions and answers at the end so you might have have that you know or have read or watched the videos or something but to actually say okay is this going to change the way I've, I've, uh, I've been working and I think you could probably build something like that uh, with sales with sales training in a CRM because everything you do is monitored 
in there. So that, that could be so that could be an interesting idea. Well, uh, we're, we're partially doing, and hopefully that's where we get to with Animus because, um, you know, as I said, the third part of Animus is, is actually giving the team insights into, hey. you know, things they're doing well and things they're not doing well. Uh, and what I found in the past is when you, when you give, when you enable teams to see that themselves, they act on it, right? They go take an appropriate learning, be, um, particularly if they're one part of a team. You know, there's this peer, no, I don't want to call it peer pressure, but, you know, you don't want to let the team down, right? Uh, if you're struggling with a particular sales skill and, and that's evident, um, you know, the likelihood is you'll go and, and fix that and take some training to bridge that gap. And, and you would hope other members of the team will do the same thing. Fabulous. Hey, Mark, what do you think? What's, what's next on the list there? Um, if you could do business anywhere in the world, where would it be? Uh, Ireland, I think. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, uh, I've worked in the U S I've worked in India. I've worked in, uh, Australia for a while. Uh, I just think there's something, you know, really exciting about doing business in Ireland. I, I think, you know, we, not just in, in terms of, you know, who we are and our culture and how we build relationships and how we work together. I just think we, um, extremely bright nation <laughs> right you know and uh, we do it with a smile on our face and i think i think we're we we're we're real and we're authentic and, and and people look out for each other and i think you know going back to some of the why mentors help in the ndrc you know we're just looking to give people a leg up and uh, i think you know we're we're there's a sense we're in it together in some way so so ireland yeah i love that it's like team ireland i like it do, one of this kind of is digressing a little bit, but when you're in India, mm. when you were there, were you kind of worried is the wrong word, I would say. But I, whenever I speak to people from India or um, I, I had a recruiting business that was ill-fated uh, before and the amount of CVs I'd get from India, really high level people coming out of there. Mm. Yeah. Like, you, do you see India when, from being there? Did you, do you feel like this, this is going to be the next uh, center of technology or center of business and stuff like that. Were, were you yes. impressed by India? Immensely impressed, incredibly impressed. Um, not only have they got, uh, you know, I mean, look, India is, is, it's a very long, broad spectrum, right? Sure. The incredible poverty and, and distress and, and just things you never want to see or hope to see again on one end of the scale. And then, you know, on the other end of the scale, you've got this incredible, uh, education system that are churning out lots of very well educated um, people into the marketplace. So I was based in Hyderabad for nine months, which is in South Central India. Uh, you know, really, it was the beginning of their technology boom in that city. Bangalore would have been the, you know, the, the, the main center that most people would know. But um, I, I think the not, not only have they got incredible skills, incredible education, you know, huge focus on technology. Um, it's the, it's the way they work is, is, is incredible. They are um, hugely passionate about doing a great job. Um, they are loyal, committed, hardworking, right? And just want to impress, just want to do great work. And uh, I really enjoyed, enjoyed working with them. So, you know, 10 years plus later, I'm, I'm not surprised to see where they are. Absolutely. I think after I've been working with, uh, on a few deals with the, these types of people as well. It's all very interesting. When I was in Canada, I used to do, uh, I like the way they do business as well. When I was in Canada, I was um, working with, uh, I was still selling software. I was in Vancouver and I had a, a great relationship with the Sikh population there. Yeah. Uh, they all know each other. And if you do a good job with one, like they use their connections as negotiation ships to say, okay, listen, give me 10% off. My brother's going to buy this next week. He owns X, Y, and Z. And then you'd not believe them really at the beginning but then the brother would call you the next week and he'd be like yeah um you know uh jamal said i had to call you and buy software from you because he you know like they would really like I, I, it was really interesting how they did business there. i mean incredible entrepreneurs right at every level from from the from the market that's selling you know car spare car parts right you know you know stacked high you know two stories high of you know hubcaps to you know the guys in, i mean every there's entrepreneurship at every up every corner every opportunity whether it's uh, and that leads all the way up to tech so uh, yeah i think they're i think they're incredible super interesting 
Oh. So, what do you think? Okay, next one. How much money is enough money? Uh, I think um, how much money is enough money? I would say, you know, it. I would say enough. I mean, you know, you can. The immediate thing that always comes to mind is kind of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? That that comes to mind. So it's um, it's rel- It's completely relevant, uh, relative. I think you know when you have lots of money, you know, it doesn't it doesn't make you happy. When you have no money. <laughs> You wish you had money to make you happy. So I don't know if there's a single answer here. Look, I, 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 think, I think for me personally, it's, it's having enough money to put a roof over our head, you know, keep, our, keep my family safe, put my, give my kids a decent education um, and, and, and have enough money to be able to follow my dreams, I guess. Things like Animus and, and being able to do that. I'm not looking to make, I'm not money driven uh, at all in that way it's i guess enough money to to do the basics and then enough to enable you kind of follow follow your dreams a little does that sound really cheesy no um, that's actually a common theme actually uh, that yeah. hierarchy of needs and then to be able to essentially follow your your dreams whatever, well do you know what they may be yeah do you know what's interesting if you it, like we always talk about maslow and we talk about the first couple of levels right you know getting you know, roof over your head and food and security and all those basics in place. And we're lucky, lucky enough from Western society that we've ticked those boxes, I think, quite some time ago. So now we're focused on the upper echelons, right, which is all about self-actualization and interdependency, which is like really coming together with people to, 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 to work and achieve things. And uh, yeah, I guess, I guess that's, we're lucky in Ireland that, we're developed, developed so much that we can now have a conversation about fulfilling our dreams and self-actualizing. I mean, it's quite a, it's quite a privileged position to be in, but it's a, it's a good place to be. And Mark Baker, I was actually on this point, I was uh, flicking through my Instagram there on the, uh, the Greystones guide. I don't know if you're not from Greystones, you don't know, but it's, it's a big deal around here. It's like a, it's like a, it tells you what's going on in the little town, but there's a, they put up a picture of this guy. He was like, it was 94th birthday or something. Um, and it was talking, you know, it was just saying like happy birthday, but it listed all of the stuff he had done for the town. He's like the treasurer of the swimming club. He'd like organized all these things, like a whole list of, uh, stuff that he had done, you know, in the community. And I was just thinking like, even if he wasn't really well off, he's, it looks like he's had a really kind of good life. People, you know, he's touched a lot of people, uh, in the community and stuff like that. And I was kind of thinking that's kind of a cool thing to think about as well. Not just from a money point of view, but you like can, a life CV. Yeah, it's more like the life CV in that case, uh, for sure. Um, no, I, absolutely, absolutely. And, I, you know, I think, I think we are at a moment of reflection, right, across the world, right, for, for lots of reasons, right, um, where we're actually thinking more about, you know, what are the intrinsic motivations, right? What, what makes a meaningful life? What makes a happy life? And I think to your point, it's, you know, all the research shows, all the evidence shows, and even I know myself being, you know, just a little bit beyond midlife, uh, that it is about, it is about connections and it is about family and it is about community, uh, actually. And I think, you know, people are starting to realize that and, and come back to the, ba- come back to basics. Absolutely. It's really, really interesting. Hey, Mark, what about one more? What's, what's the burning question that you've got there? Because we're, we're pushing a, an hour here. Okay, right. Two more, as I always say. So uh, it, is, it, is it who you know or is it what you know? Uh, I think it's def- it, it's it's definitely what you know initially, um, for sure. Uh, I think you you know if we're talking in the business context, you I you know I we've got I've got to a point based on building knowledge and experience over I guess twenty plus years. So uh, you know, gain having deep domain knowledge, I think gives you the foundation. So absolutely, initially, it's what you know. Uh, going back to my earlier conversation with Alan Costello in the NDRC, I think what, you know, interested him was the fact I had this broad knowledge of, of B2B selling, not just from a sales perspective, but from a, a process and operations and from a learning perspective. So the what is, is, is what I think gets you a foot in the door. Uh, and then of course the how, as you try to build your business, grow your business, scale your business, um, it's, it's, and you know, you guys are from sales. It's all about making connections with people and the right people. 
And, and I always find that, uh, you know, have conversation, challenge yourself to have conversations with people that you mightn't have thought, you know, initially there's something there because inevitably it opens up other possibilities, other doors. So, um, yeah, yeah, it's, it's what you know, but then you got to switch the focus to building that network and, and, and getting out there. Yeah, spot on. Last yeah. one. What advice would you give? Uh, no, so if you, if you could ask someone to tell someone to, to learn one skill, what would it be? Learn one skill. Uh, bu- 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 learn one skill. Uh, dee- dee- dee. I, you know, I think it's probably um, learn one skill. Become a good researcher. I actually, research and curiosity. Because um, I think... I think the next generation of solutions are going to come from a convergence of stuff we've done in the last 10 to 20 years. I, I honestly believe that. Um, so if you look at digital transformation for, as an example, the companies I think who are doing really, really innovative stuff uh, are really kind of bringing together different disciplines. So I would say if there's one skill, you know, just have a broad set of interests, you know, technology, people, culture, politics, economics, <laughs> socio uh, uh, politics, you know, what, whatever the case is, just have a, a very broad set of interests. Because I think if you have that, you can start to make some connections and join the dots between those different interests. And I think ultimately, that kind of fuels new ideas, new concepts and, and innovation. Excellent. Perfect. Perfect. So there's one more question. Uh, that we ask our our our, sh- our sharks on the shark pot uh, every week. Um, would you prefer one a t shirt that looks like this, or would you prefer a uh, a mug that has that logo on it? What w- what would you prefer uh, to have? I I think the t shirt. I mean, you I, looks it, it looks good on you. All right. I, I can see that. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll 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 organize the 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 shirt. Uh, Danny O'Neill, thank you very much for coming on the Shark Pod today. It's been great to have a chat with you. Best of luck with Animus Labs. It sounds like it's just about to to really kick off there. So uh, we'll watch from the sidelines uh, as as cheerleaders, like all the other people that we have on our on our podcast. Um, love the stuff about the uh, reorganizing how people uh, do sales in the modern environment. Love the the last few uh, answers from our. Um, for our quick fire questions it's all been great so thanks very much and uh, we'll we'll let you know when this one is out thanks Danny thanks, nice Danny thank you very much it was fabulous we had a